a little glitch there, I guess, at the end. Anyways, welcome back to the Gnostic Informant. Wow, Let's man, you, you, you have like as Braxis everything. You have, <laughs> like you like triple the the tr the thrice grace as a Braxis. Yes, I uh, actually just got some of my own merch just so I can like kind of present it while I'm, while I'm doing these things. But um, yeah, and you roughly change your gnosis. I gotta finish that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's going uh, on, Doctor Sledge? Uh, not a lot. It's uh, you know, they're in sort of the mad dash of the holidays and um you know working on the channel and you know trying to roll it over to 200k by halloween so that's the that's the goal if we can roll it over to 200k by halloween i'd be super stoked about that but yeah you've we'll been putting see. out some great content lately thank In you fact, let me just pull this up real quick uh so i can show anybody who's living under a rock <laughs> and hasn't found esoteric yet um hold on one second oh, i gotta turn that volume down but uh okay so yeah, esoteric guys. This is one of my inspirations right here. This is my go-to. Like I got you. Get, there's Litwa, there's Tabor, and then there's Sledge also in the esoteric <laughs> realm. This is one of my go-tos, and it says that I'm not subscribed only because it's not signed in. So I'm definitely subscribed to Esoterica, <laughs> and I got that bell hit. So awesome. uh, you guys should do the same. He's putting out great content, academic level stuff, getting into the the, the uh, the stuff that mo a lot of academics won't touch because it sometimes can be a little bit um, too, I don't know, what do you, what's the word to say? It's it's like far out there. Like some, yeah, it's, some it's of like, this stuff is really, but I love it. And I think a lot of my fans love it too. It's great. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think a lot of academics don't touch it just because they're not trained to. You know, there's only like I yeah. always point this out. There's only one institution in the world where you can get an, an advanced degree in this kind of stuff. And so it's not that they do or don't. I think that they just they don't have the expertise to do it. And uh, luckily, I do. And you know, I'm able to produce content on a, a range of stuff. Like we're be getting into some of the, um, you know, and some of the stuff is not translated. Like that Roycelin episode that I just did last week. There's no translation of that book into English. And so I had to work straight up with the Latin to make that episode. Wow. So, yeah. So if you some of this stuff, there's just there aren't even Wikipedia articles on some of these yeah. texts that uh, that I that I'm working with. And uh, this this week I'm doing an episode on uh, some of the theology, the Kabbalistic uh, theology behind uh, the messianism of Shabbatai Tzvi. And uh, that stuff has just gotten republished and only in Hebrew. So, you know, a lot of this, some of the stuff I work on, you just can't find um, even translations yeah. of. So it's, it's, it's fun, but yeah, it's, it's not called esoteric for, esoterica for nothing. Right. You're not going to get this anywhere else, anywhere else. And you just have so many wide ranging topics. I mean, if you go to your playlist, look at this witchcraft, women in occultism, demonology, Jewish magic like that is a topic right there that I want to check out. Hermetic philosophy, occult film review, mysticism, Gnosticism. It's all there, guys. Check it out. Like, seriously, like it's one of my favorite, arguably my favorite channel. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be back, too. Thank you for inviting me on. Uh for a fun topic today uh definitely some necronomicon stuff yeah, i got my 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 little yellow copy yeah we said we compared we have our, our two different copies this you know this little evil book uh which you can easily get it you know barnes and noble <laughs> right um yeah so i mean why don't you give us a little intro about this thing a little basic rundown of what it is what it came from is it based on anything actually let me start with this i, I just thought of something i put out a post a couple weeks ago because I was starting to read through this for the first time. Well, not the first time, but the, actually read it for the first time, not just like flip through it like I did before. I was actually reading it through, like real, like really reading it. And I'm like, okay, who's this mad Arab character? And I'm looking at the back of this thing, and it's like, oh, they didn't believe he was real, this, that, and the third. So I'm thinking maybe this guy's based off something real in history. I'm like, okay, whatever. And um, I put, put a post up, and you were like, just so you know, he's not real. I was like, oh, I want him to be real so bad. Yeah, that's every, everybody wants their... Everybody wants there to be a Necronomicon. It's just yeah. like the thing. And in fact, people want it so badly, they make it up. I mean, that's how badly they want it to be real is that they make so it interesting. real. It's so, interesting. Um, so yeah, it's a funny kind of thing that people conjure into existence. But yeah, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, so for folks that don't know, the Necronomicon is a literary fiction invented by H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, the early 20th century writer of weird fiction. Um, sort of the progenitor. Weird fiction sort of gave rise to like horror and sci-fi and kind of the mix of that. If you've ever read about Cthulhu or any of that stuff, uh, if you've ever seen like tentacle monsters from other dimensions, that's sort of weird fiction uh, in the in the guise of of H.P. Lovecraft. But he invented it as a kind of deceit in his novels uh, where this uh, 
tome, which in, in the in the actual stories of Lovecraft, the Necronomicon is like a, a thousand pages long. It's a huge, huge volume, much bigger than this little rinky dink thing. Um, and uh, and so he's he you know he eventually he would quote from it. Of course, these quotations are sort of made up. Uh, he would give a, a fake history for it. He would say that it was translated by various people, like John Dee or whatever. And um, over time, it kind of began to function both in his stories, but also he had a network of friends who would also write these weird tales. They were published in various kinds of pulp fiction back in the day, and they started using it. And so it kind of got a, a life of its own. And eventually, by um, a, a co over the course of the, of the 20th century, people started making Necronomicons, writing them. Uh, and of course, the most famous one here is the Simon one. And this is the one if you've ever been to like an occult bookshop or Barnes & Noble and gone to the occult section or whatever, they're inevitably going to have this one. And um, this one, we can get into sort of how it got written, but it's sort of a mishmash of H.P. Lovecraft stuff, some Aleister Crowley stuff uh, that I know you've had Dr. Angela Puka on to talk about him a little bit, and uh, also uh, some Mesopotamian mythology. So they kind of mishmash it all together and make it into a, um, not exactly a workable system of magic. Um, in fact, it was intentionally designed not to be workable, actually, which is kind of interesting, but um, as a kind of booby trap, even magical booby trap. But um, for whatever reason, it's captured people's imagination since it was published in the 70s and through the 80s and 90s. It was sort of the if you wanted to be the edgy kid at high school, whatever you got you a copy of the Necronomicon. And, um, but yeah, the Lovecraft, uh, had a sort of, uh, fake pen name when he was a kid. He really loved the 1001 Arabian Nights. And so he had a dream of a guy named Abdul al Hazred, and al Hazred became the, the, the writer of this, uh, Necronomicon text. And so, um, you know, Lovecraft himself conjured it from, from dreams and all kinds of things. And some of the quotations in Lovecraft's stories are pretty spooky and terrifying even, but, um, but that's basically where it comes from. It's a literary deceit uh, invented by invented by H.P. Lovecraft. Wow. And so, oh, the super chat just popped up. Let's just check it out. Why not? Let's sure. Mika Val, thank you for your super chat. Do you think, Mika Val, thank you for your super chat. I said it so fast. Sorry. Do you think the gods and symbols in this book are based on real Mesopotamian lore? That's a great question. So the answer is kind of, um, kind of. So the text purports to be ancient Sumerian, and if you know anything about ancient Sumeria, uh, you'll you'll be you'll be clicked off Im Im uh, immediately that this is not Sumerian. There's actually a mishmash of things here. There are Sumerian things, there are Babylonian things, and there are Assyrian things. And of course, anyone who knows anything about the ancient Near East knows that that that's thousands of years of culture. And so there's a mishmash of of divinities. So for, for instance. Um, I don't know, Pazuzu shows up. Pazuzu is mostly a, a Syrian deity. Um, there are other, like Yunana is actually, a Sumer, is actually a Sumerian deity. So you have like all these different Mesopotamian cultures kind of blended together. And this happens sometimes when people don't really don't know their history very well. They'll mix cultures together that actually don't have much to do with each other. The most classic example, if folks have ever seen the movie Apocalypto that Mel Gibson made, he kind of blends together the Aztecs and the Mayans in kind of a composite thing that never really existed. <laughs> and, for, and for people who know anything about the Mayans and the Aztecs, you see them like sacrificing people on top of pyramids, but they're clearly like, Maya people, they're speaking Maya language. You're like, <laughs> it's like if you blended the Anglo Saxons and, and I don't know, uh, like the Anglo Saxons and, and the phalanx Greek soldiers together into one composite weird thing. Anyone who knew anything about Anglo Saxon warriors and Greek warriors would realize something terribly wrong here. And so in the Necronomicon, you get this sort of mixed up grab bag of Mesopotamian stuff. Um, and in fact, they you can even do this if you want. You can go to the actual sources they list on the, uh, in the bibliography of this thing, which is uh, on page, and they're all the same, so I can basically give it. Um, yeah, bibliography selected readings. Um, if you go there, they quote Pritchard's um, ancient Mesopotamian text related to the Old Testament. They just steal stuff from there and then wow. mix in H.P. Lovecraft stuff. Uh -huh. um, so that's kind of the way that works. The symbols are straight up not Mesopotamian. Um, if you look at cuneiform magical tablets, of which we have a vast array, no symbols like this appear. These symbols are almost always taken from European magic. And in fact, again, for a book right. that's allegedly Sumerian magic, um, there's just straight up Greek letters everywhere. And yeah. so um, the text can't quite make its mind up. And of course, he says that the, the writer of this, Simon, says that uh, the text was translated from Greek. 
but it would be really weird if Sumerian Sumerian magic, which we have lots of evidence of, and, and Babylonian magic, which we have a lot of evidence of, like the Makli ritual, um, uh, if that were the case. And this text is a really weird composite mishmash of things. So uh, the symbols, certainly not. Some of the rituals, kind of, but um, but in a general way, it's just a, a pastiche, I guess I would call it. Um, yeah. And, and, and these parts where they start going off on this, this weird language of is that just gibberish? Is this Lovecraft's own made up language? So some of this stuff actually is Sumerian. So some like, you know, Zdingir, like that, that, yeah, Dinger is actually like Sumerian. That is a, and they're copying this from, from, from other texts. So some of this, yes, like some of these words actually are, uh, Sumerian. Some of them are, uh, some of them are, are Akkadian. So like, again, they can't make their mind up or is this sex Sumerian or Akkadian? So, um, so a word like, um, uh, I don't know, um, like some of the gods' names are clearly. Yeah. I'm trying to find one that's Eresh, clearly like Eresh okay. calls is definitely a real, real god. Yeah, Eresh Kigal is like um, it's the you know the the woman in the the underworld, the queen of the underworld. Yeah. Um, I mean, the last section, the Magan text, is just a sort of a mishmash ripoff of the descent of uh, the descent of Inanna uh, oh, into the right. underworld, the ascent of Ishar into the underworld, which is a classic text from the ancient Near East. So they kind of just rip it off. Um, but like a sheep too, like a, a sheep too uh, is a is a Akkadian word. It's not a Sumerian word, uh, and you can always tell because uh, Sumerian words are very very short typically, um, as opposed to Akkadian, which Akkadian and Sumerian are not related languages. Akkadian is um, a Semitic language related distantly to Hebrew. In fact, sometimes you can even read Akkadian through a Hebrew lens darkly. But Sumerian is a linguistic isolate. We don't know where in the world that language came from, um, and the the word the words there typically are a lot shorter. Uh, so word like in like means house, but it can also mean temple. So those are really the Sumerian words tend to be a lot shorter. But they're just taking these incantations from other texts and sort of manipulating them um, to fit into the text. Like kashiptu is a good example. Is a that's the Akkadian word for uh, sorceress. Oh wow. Or a peach too, um, so they do exist, and in fact, you can even hear from um, um, from Hebrew like that the word like like witch, macha um, shefa, um, in in Hebrew uh, is actually the same root in, in Akkadian. They they mutate differently, but it's the, it's the exact same the exact same root. Like and so kishpu is the word for Akkadian word for magic kishpu, and you can hear macha shefa. Uh, the one who does kishpu, like it's the exact same root word, basically in Akkadian. And are any of, now these symbols that you you mentioned, like I'll just kind of show the camera these little symbols that you can yeah. see. Is any of this stuff come from any other of these? Like I know I know around this time, I mean, even before this, there was a lot of these like texts that were coming out. These um, what's the word for them? Grimoire, I think, right? Yeah, Grim grimoires. Yeah, books of ceremonial magic. Yeah, is it, is there a lot of relation to those? Is this, is this so? So that section, right, you're, the section you're looking at is called the Book of the 50 Names. So what they've done in the Book of 50 Names is that there is a list in um, um, a list in Babylonian, right, in Akkadian, that lists the 50 names of Marduk. Marduk is a Babylonian god, not a Sumerian god. Right. Um, but again, it's just where this stuff gets all confused. <laughs> um, and so, um, so they have a list of 50 names of Marduk. What they did basically was take out all those 50 names and then they invented sigils for them. And those sigils are those little weird symbols with little curly cues and the circles attached to them, the little ringlets. And those are taken directly from Western European, um, West, largely Western European and Levant, Levantine magic. And we see those symbols, for instance, if you look up the symbols in the Lesser Key of Solomon, you'll see right. very similar symbols in the Lesser Key of Solomon. And they're just basically making their own version of the Lesser Key of Solomon using these 50 names of Marduk. Although it is interesting because one of the 50 names of Marduk, they, or a couple of the 50 names of Marduk they give are actually wrong. Um, I think it's on page 145. Uh, and if you just look through them, most of them are right. They go through them and they are correct. But the, I think it's uh, Luga Luga is not right. It's just like gibberish. It's like made up. They just made some mistake or something. So that one's actually incorrect. So they just make funny oh. mistakes. It's just sort of funny mistakes that, <laughs> again, any, not again, not that anyone who's reading this text, if you're familiar with, 
ancient Near East mythology, you're just going to see a mishmash of things that don't make any sense. I mean, the Sumerian pantheon and the Akkadian pantheon, they don't map onto each other very well. Um, and it would just, I'm trying to think, it'd, it'd be sort of like, sometimes you like when you see um, Julius Caesar will do this, he'll try to map the Roman pantheon onto the Celtic pantheon and it doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, like it just seems like it's like yeah, and the druids worship Mercury, and you're like, good what? point. Yeah, it's just weird. It's like yeah, anyone you, who, get, you get Tacitus who's like they worship Isis. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're like, huh? <laughs> do they? Do, yeah. do if you ask a druid, do they worship Isis? Are they gonna say that? You're like, who's uh, that? <laughs> yeah, and so it, it's you know, of course, them trying to make sense of the world, but this is an example of someone who clearly has access to, um, synch like synchrist like, synch like a secretic understanding of mesopotamian mythology but because they have the entire mythology in front in front of them they don't know where to draw the line between what is sumerian what's akkadian what's assyrian what's greek and so you get this really mishmash text wow that's a good point thank you for yeah. that super chat uh yeah. mike mike a very good question actually that opened up a nice little uh you know topic right there There's yeah a one from jim markstein what was the direct impact of this book on the culture, and how did the church react? Ooh, this is, so you mean this book here, the the Simon Necronomicon? Um, I, I suppose that's what you mean. You can I can I rephrase it, but I mean you got to understand this book was published like right before the rise of the Satanic Panic, you know. Um, so this book entered in basically really gets into popular printing in the early to mid eighties. And so it just lands in the middle of the satanic panic. It was written in the late seventies kind of as a joke. And it was a joke that took on its own legs and got out of, you know, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's always a funny thing when people take jokes too seriously. And this is a joke taken very seriously, but um, yeah, you see this text like jump out into the real world and, and people really try to, you know, do this kind of stuff. And, and of course, if you're someone who's a little bit familiar with the practices of Western European magic and the, and the magical traditions, at least since the seven, you know, 16th and 17th centuries, is that typically if you're doing rituals like this, you're going to you're going to do some kind of protective magic to protect yourself from summoning evil spirits, or at least you're going to bind them in some kind of way, like in a magic circle so they can't get out and bother you. And then you're going to have to banish them later. This text is kind of designed to be a magical booby trap, which it shows you all kinds of ways to banish things. But there are no, or how to summon all this stuff, but there's no way in this book to banish any of this stuff. And none of, there's no techniques in this book to really bind anything. And so they wrote the book, and it was sort of written around the magical child, uh, so called Warlock Shop in Brooklyn in the late 70s. And it was actually handed to uh, students of magic, ceremonial magic, as a way basically to test them. They would look at it and go, hold on, there are parts clearly missing, and there are contradictory magical elements in here, and no one should try to do any of this. <laughs> and so it was meant to be kind of like a like a test like right? like you would you know like a, a magical test and then um for reasons that you know they're still murky because we still don't know exactly who published this thing or who wrote it it was probably written by a group of people and it sort of got in the wild and got published remember like the the magic shop that produced it was also a publishing house magical child publishing and they rushed it to publication and it's it did very well some people made a lot of money from it still making money from it and um so that's sort of you know how it got out there um i th i don't know that the church at least the, the catholic church has ever had an official position on it at all um but but again it's the most ubiquitous again i think you go into a, a, a barnes and noble or a books a million or whatever in the 90s and you certainly they're copied by their paperbacks of it everywhere you can get it for like a nickel on amazon used it's it's just ubiquitous so I think it became the face in many ways of um, of the anxieties around people pl practicing black magic during the, 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 the days of the satanic panic into the late 80s and 90s. So I think that in that way, it became sort of like people got really scared of it. But again, it's so hilarious, right? Because it began as a joke. It's obviously a, like a mess if you know anything about magic and or Mesopotamian mythology. And yet there are still people out there you know, trying to summon up these spirits or, or what have you. And people to this day, it's had a huge impact, for instance, in chaos magic, where people really do believe that uh, these rituals or whatever have um, some kind of effect, whether it's psychological or, or metaphysical. I don't know. I, sure. Uh, so it's it's had enormous effect, enormous, enormous impact on the the on a culture, you might call it. Right. Yeah. The, the, the culture of the occult. So it's, it has a big impact. But I don't think the church cares. They got bigger fish to fry. That's a good point. And, and I noticed that 
this book sort of became the like the, the norm for a lot of movies and films and shows to like have a magic book pop up and they're holding a necromonicon in their hand and some demon jumps out of the book just the other day actually i was watching a show on hbo now it's actually an adult swim show and it's called your pretty face is going to hell it's a comedy and they're all in there it's a bunch of demons they have horns they're all in hell and uh satan walks in the business room because like they're it's like a, it's like a corporation it's like a joke <laughs> hell's a corporation of course it would be yeah yeah so satan walks into the business room he's holding the necromonicon in his hand and i was like yeah this book really does have an impact on the culture oh yeah i mean hp lovecraft has had a huge i was just at the necronomicon right the the big um uh like con of hp lovecraft it usually takes place in his hometown of providence rhode island around his birthday i was just there i gave an academic paper at it and um yeah it's a huge thing i mean it was thousands of people there uh, there's an academic side, there are people cosplaying, there's gaming going on, all wrapped up in the world of H.P. Lovecraft, and the Necronomicon is obviously front and center of all that. But right. yeah, it's, it has its place in Evil Dead, it has a, a, its place in all kinds of, it has its tendrils, so to speak. And of course, this version of the Necronomicon is just one of a dozen different Necronomicons yeah. that have been produced over the past, whatever, 50 years. And so there are just tons and tons and tons of these. And um, yeah, they're, they're just, you could collect them. They could be a hobby of yours because some of them are very rare and worth a lot of money. So um, it's funny because yeah. I've seen copies of the Necronomicon for sale of one of these kinds of Necronomicons that cost more than antiquarian books that are 500 years old. Wow. And so it's just, it, it could be a hobby of yours to, to collect them. And there are some of them out there worth a lot of money, especially early printing. I think they only printed, the first printing was only like 666, you know, of course. Yeah, this person, this person right here is, has a comment. Scott, shoot, thank you for this, the comment. Have a first edition five seventy nine. If it's numbered like that, you know. Yeah, that. if you have if you have a really early copy, it's it's surely worth a lot of money. I'd hold on to it. Um, it's gonna be it's only going to appreciate in value, I think. And the H.P. Lovecraft Necronomicon fra you know phase is not gonna go is not gonna go anywhere. So, but it's really I mean I love the the Necronomicon lore in the Lovecraft stories because you know it's there are only five copies left in the world and they're at these elite institutions you know and. Uh, there are this great translation histories where John Dee's involved in one version of it and things like that. So it's uh, Lovecraft did a good job of kind of backfilling the story to make it more believable. And I think also just, there's just a part of us that loves the idea of like ancient evil books that, you know, the, I always say the Venn diagram of people who are interested in like the occult or the esoteric and people who like old books are like a circle. That's just one circle of people. And I think all of us like the idea that there are these ancient books containing unspeakable things or what have you. And um, I think we want it so much, we invent, we, we made it. We created one in the form of the Necronomicon. But um, that's interesting. And it's even interesting looking through Lovecraft's literature. You can see even what he has in mind about what the Necronom Necronomicon is changes throughout the course of his uh, literary career. Like it begins being one thing, and then by the end of his career, it's actually something else. And it actually changes over the course of his career. And um, what's fascinating is it starts off as kind of witchcraft lore. It's associated with witchcraft lore. And then by the end of it, it's actually all about these ancient aliens that have come to Earth before human beings were there. And it's all the lore about those ancient pre-human aliens. And so it's a, it's a huge grab bag of weird stuff and Lovecraft's stories. And so, uh, and he was actually even asked during his lifetime by fans of his to write it. And he was like, nah, there's no way I can do that. This thing is a thousand pages long. I'm not that smart. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, even in his lifetime, he was asked to write one and, and wow. never did. And That's he and even had to write fans. Uh, fans would write him being like, yeah, I look for the Necronomicon. I couldn't find it. And he had to write them back being like, yeah, it's not real. Um, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> That's interesting. That's kind of cool. That's kind of a cool story right there. Yeah. Thank you for that super chat or that uh, comment. Jay Moore, thank you for this super chat. Can you define what you mean by workable workable and trap. Yeah. So in, at least in this case, like I said earlier, this was, this book was in, was written so far as we can tell by a sort of cadre of people that uh, hung out in the, in the occult scene in the late seventies there in New York, in Brooklyn. And the book was sort of cobbled together. Basically people got really hammered one night and decided to do this. And they kind of over the course of a little while, cobble it together. And by what I mean, workable is that Typically in ceremonial magic, if you're going to summon supernatural creatures, whatever those are, typically you have to have a way to protect yourself, 
because you don't want them troubling you and they don't want to be troubled typically. And so by conjuring them, I mean, it's just sort of like ripping them away from what they were doing and sort of generally speaking, it pisses them off, it seems. But you want to have some mechanism to protect yourself. You want to have some mechanism to force them to come to you. And you want to have some mechanism to force them to stay where they are so that they can be basically uh, bound over to your bidding. And you see this in an array of magical literature going back to the Greek magical papyri through medieval grimoires, the Lesser Key of Solomon, tons and tons of literature work in this way. And so that's a pretty standard trope in terms of how to get these beings. You need to have a magical technique from getting them there, keeping them there and protecting yourself. That's the three things you, that's the three ingredients typically that all of these magical systems that deal with conjuring these creatures involve. Well, the Necronomicon just has one of those features, you know? So if you think about a stool, a stool needs to have three legs to stand up, at least three. If you take away any leg, you have a problem. The Necronomicon takes away two of those legs, but it doesn't make it clear that it's doing it. And so what you have is a system that allows you to summon creatures, but not protect yourself, right? And it has, it has a ways of you uh, summoning those creatures, but not getting rid of them. There are no banishings for them. And so... And in fact, if you read the end of the, uh, if you read the end of the Necronomicon, well, that's what happens to him, right? Is he's had all this contact with all these beings and he's tried to basically get involved with this war between these two groups, the Zonai and the Azonai, um, which he kind of makes into sort of good guys and bad guys, although that's not the way Mesopotamian mythology worked. Right. Um, and that's not the way H.P. Lovecraft's mythology worked, although August Dereleth's interpretation of H.P. Lovecraft's mythology worked that way. So again, you can tell which kind of mythology they're reading. Hmm. But at any rate, um, uh, you know, the Mad Arab, right, Abdullah Hazard just gets killed at the end of this, right? He's just wiped out. And in fact, if you read Lovecraft's original history of the Necronomicon, uh, Abdullah Hazard, I believe, is ripped apart in the streets of Damascus, just torn apart by invisible spirits or, or some kind of invisible spirit or whatever. So there's a kind of idea that this opens doors you can't close. And typically, people who practice ceremonial magic, if you know what you're doing, you would never, ever fall for that. It's it's like inviting a, a, a tiger into your house with no way of getting rid of them. And so that's what I mean by a trap, that the book was engineered as a kind of booby trap, but it was engineered as a kind of joke, but at the same time as a way of testing novice magical practitioners to see if they really knew what they were doing because wow. any any advanced or any any sane magical practitioner would look at this and go nope <laughs> like why would i summon all kinds of horrifying creatures like humbaba or pazuzu with no mechanism to control them no mechanism to uh bind them to my power and no mechanism to get rid of them wow. that's a it's a suicide and so that's what this book uh contains is is what what might be called uh sort of metaphysical magical traps wow that's a very very interesting super chat thank you for that that was a good yeah. good answer too and thank you uh mr monster thank you for the super chat is there any similarities between muhammad and the mad arab yeah it's interesting so it's a great question i lovecraft never you know no lovecraft never makes any connection between muhammad and and the mad arab um one gets a sense that that the that the mad arab abdullah hazard maybe exists before islam um, folks often forget that before Islam swept through the Arabic world, there were all kinds of forms of Arabic paganism uh, that existed at the time. In fact, we have some survivals of that pre-Islamic paganism in a book called The Nabatee and Ag uh, Agriculture. Even Maimonides mentions that there were still some of these, even after Islam, called the Sabians. And the, uh, the Quran even mentions the Sabians as sort of strange monotheists that aren't Jews and aren't Christians or something else. Maybe they were Mandeans. We're not sure. Right. Um, the Mandeans claim they're Sabians mostly to protect themselves. And sadly, they've been the victim of uh, horrifying persecution for many centuries. But yeah, I don't think so. I think that the idea is that the mad Arab Abdul Hazard sort of is maybe a pre-Islamic uh, pagan. And it's part of that pre-Islamic pagan world. Or maybe even if it, Islam has come, he lives, he maybe lives at the fringes of society. And he certainly isn't a Muslim. Um, he certainly isn't a Muslim. He's dealing with paganism and summoning all kinds of ancient gods and stuff like that. And there's no mention of Allah. Uh, and I think it just has a lot to do with one with Lovecraft's own fascination with the thousand one Arabian nights. Yeah. That's where, and I think it has a lot to do with that, but also this is a common trope in European, the ima European imagination is if you want to have something weird, make it happen in Egypt or happen in Arabia. And 
Um, you know, it's sort of a, the East is weird. And so it's that kind of trope. But no, I don't think there's any connection between the Prophet Muhammad and Abdul Al-Hazred. Yeah, In fact, can... Al-Hazred is not even an Arabic name. Like there's no name like that. It's just like made, uh, Abdul's a real name, right. but Al Hazrat is not even a word. It, it just literally, there's a lot of guesses about how uh, Lovecraft made this up, but apparently he heard it in a dream, one of his dreams he had when he was a kid. Um, and he kind of went by it and then eventually uh, transferred the name from him to uh, to the to the writer of the, the Necronomicon. And not, not to get too far off topic, but you mentioned the 1001 Nights. And I, there's a text, there's a, there's a story in there. I love this story. I, everybody should go and check it out. But they talk about they found this ruin of a city that Solomon had built. Yeah, the city of brass. The city of brass. Yeah, yeah that's a great story. Bridges and the, these maps, and they found like all these like you know interesting technological advancements and jewels and all this type of stuff. And they found and, and then in there the weirdest thing ever. They found a a book of Psalms. It's in like an ancient Greek dialect. This is what the writer says. And it's like, I forgot what they said. I think it's like Ionian characters or something like that. Something, yeah. something like that. I can't remember, but I'm just, I'm just reading this thing. I was like, this is such a good story. It's such a great story. Yeah. That's a, that's the most famous one. I think in fact, Lovecraft, even um, Lovecraft, even kind of based some of his stories on that. There's a city in Lovecraft that he calls Irim, the city of the pillars. And there's a story in Arabic lore about the city of pillars. It's sort of like a, Islamic or a pre-Islamic version of Atlantis. It was a very powerful city and da 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 da, but it became cursed and the sand swallowed it up. Now it's the city of pillars is now swallowed beneath the sands. And so it's sort of like the Arabic uh, Atlantis story. But um, but yeah, Lovecraft borrowed some of those elements and they become so this the city of Irim or the city of pillars in uh, Lovecraft stories. But yeah, the brass, the city of brass is definitely, I think, a real one of the best stories, especially if you like, you know, Atlantis type stuff. It's great. Yeah. It's a great story. Yeah. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you for that. Jim Markstein is with, back with another one. Did Lovecraft write any other books that relate to this, a sequel or a prequel? So I guess what it may be, maybe, maybe you mean like, did he write, are there books older than the Necronomicon in Lovecraft's lore? Yes, that's, yeah. So this, uh, the Lovecraft, the, the Necronomicon is the most famous and it's the most frequently cited. And I think it was written in the 800s, 700s, I think, according to Lovecraft, something like that. Um, and then translated to Greek and then translated to uh, Latin and translated to English. Uh, but um, there is another text called the Nicoptic Manuscripts that Lovecraft talks about that's actually older than the Necronomicon. It's actually written, it's lore written down even before human beings came into existence. It's like pre-human lore. Because you have to remember, like Lovecraft is friends with like the guy that, invented Conan the Barbarian and all that stuff takes place in like oh, pre wow. oh yeah like Robert Block and all, all the you know Lovecraft knows all these guys like the you know Robert Block the guy that wrote that would go on to write Psycho like Lovecraft knows all these guys that are writing all these stories and uh, he knows the guys that are you know the guy writing um, uh, Conan and Conan of course takes place before civilization as we know it takes place 10,000 years ago and whatever and so there's the idea that history is a lot older. And so Lovecraft has the idea that there are books that have survived from that period that are very rare. Uh, the Nicoptic Manuscripts is the one that Lovecraft, and in fact, it's the second most referenced uh, text after the Necronomicon in Lovecraft's literature. But not really a sequel. I mean, um, in the sense that, um, that there are stories that come after it. I mean, his the people that follow after Lovecraft, uh, his like, the, his friends that were writing stories at the same time of him and also the people that were inspired by him and continue to write stories in the vein of Lovecraft with his gods and Cthulhu and all these same universe, uh, basically the same universe. Yeah. The same sort of cinema, the, the Lovecraft cinematic universe. Um, what people call the Cth Cthulhu mythos uh, for better or worse. But um, yeah, people continue to add chunks to the Necronomicon. They continue to add quotations from it and, and things like that. In fact, there are, uh, um, one of the early versions of the Necronomicon that you could buy is just a collection of all those references. And it would just be sort of all the things that anyone quoted from the Necronomicon. The most famous example is the, what is it called? The dreaded couplet, uh, that which is dead can never, that which is dead can never lie. And in strange eons, even death will die. That's another famous line from the, ne from the Necronomicon that nice. Lovecraft has. So, um, so, uh, which is funny because that becomes the, uh, the the words of the house of 
what are they called in Game of Thrones? The seafaring people. Oh yeah, that's the um the oh my god, I just did a video on this. Yeah. The uh the iron the king oh uh, I what is it? Iron yeah. No, Iron yeah. Islands is the name of the place. Yeah, yeah. what is the uh, I can't run that. Yeah, okay. so many years of the, But at any rate, that that their words, right? For their they they live they believe in the the, the drown god and they drown say god. like I did a whole right, video about this thing. Yeah, the drown god and like you know that which is dead can never die. Blah blah blah. They right. take that straight from Lovecraft. Yes, uh, that quotation because comes straight out of the Necronomicon. It's actually which, called the Drown God too, right? Yeah, it's called the Drown God, and that's you know people you know in the in, in the stories Lovecraft stories, Cthulhu is a kind of alien uh, that came to this planet before humans and he he and his followers were engaged in a giant battle with another alien group called the old ones and cthulhu lost he and his people lost and they they imprisoned him in a in a city uh, in real yeah down in the pacific ocean and he's sort of trapped there dreaming um and so there are uh, the idea of the drowned god it's it's taken directly from cthulhu mythos i was great joy Yes, um, yeah, I, had yeah. to look it up. I just did a video of this. I should have should be on the top of my head. Yeah, because I was like, I remember watching the show. I've never read the books. I remember watching the show and be like, that's the Cthulhu people. Um, yeah, the books actually goes in way more into the religion. The yeah. show just barely. You have one scene where he gets like um, initiated. I gets drowned. Yeah. yeah, but in the book, this is a this is a cool story. I, I should tell this. In the book, there is a character, Aaron Greyjoy, not. Not our, not the, the names are so similar. Yeah, yeah, Euron. Not Euron, but it's yeah. Euron Greyjoy, and he's a high priest, and he um he gets drowned to the point of almost death, but he actually goes into the world where the drowned god is, and he lives a whole life down there for years. When he comes back up, it's only been a few seconds. Mm. He meets the drowned god. He becomes his prophet. He, he becomes like a chosen one. In fact, it gets so deep into this guy. He's basically taken out of the the show completely. You see him for like split seconds here and there, but anyways, um, he is almost chosen to be the three eyed raven. It was hmm. between him and Brandon, and obviously we know Brandon wins that. Right. But th the three eyed raven actually went to go check out if he was worthy to be the three eyed raven, and then he wasn't. Interesting. It's like that's how important this character was. That's so fascinating. Yeah, I need to go back and read the stories or read the actual books. The books are so much so much better. So much yeah, better. of course. I mean, it's, it's always almost always the case. Um, yeah. But but yeah, even if folks have seen Lovecraft Country and stuff, that's all you know taken from these obviously taken from these stories. And, uh, and again, if you've never read some H.P. if you've ever read H.P. Lovecraft, you know, aside from the horrible racism that like populates Lovecraft was a horrifying racist. Yeah. Um, and there's just no way around that. You know, nope. so like this is what it is. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, like everybody has a racist uncle in Lovecraft. You just gotta be like, oh, he says <laughs> he's that guy. He's that guy. He's like the guy yeah. at Thanksgiving. You have to be like, God, he's at Thanksgiving again. Um but uh Lovecraft, you know, just he'll do the story will be great and they'll say he'll say something horrifyingly racist or the cat will be named something like the N-word. And you're like, God. Right. Um so you have to just deal with that and just deal with the fact that, you know, you can deal with two contradictory truths, right? One is the guy wrote cool stories and they're influential and the other, he's kind of a dirt bag. Yeah. And um, so is Aristotle. Aristotle also believed that some people were born naturally to be slaves. Right. Am I gonna, oh yeah. Like if I'm going to, am I going to throw in women, all of women, according to Aristotle, are just naturally slaves. And am I going to throw Aristotle out? Cause he said gross misogynistic stuff or no. Right. Like, um, you got to take the good with the bad and, um, uh, Plato thought that women who are pregnant can have babies that can travel down to their legs. I'd, yeah. I'd, and like, so you just got to realize so the different time periods had different weird things happening and you can't just expect everyone to be on a level. Like we're at a level now in 2022 in our collective mind where we can understand some things are wrong. Some things are, and like, we get that we have that ability. We had that upper, upper advantage over people in the past. Right. Yeah. It's been moral yeah. progress. Yeah. It's been moral progress. And, um, but yeah, but yeah, Lovecraft, he has his own moral failures, but I'm sure we have our own moral failures and history will probably judge us harshly as well. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. Mr. Monster. Thank you for the super chat. M my favorite Lovecraft book is at the mountains of madness. What is yours? Yeah. Uh, at the mountain of madness is a great, uh, story because it's sort of, uh, in many of Lovecraft stories, all the, the weird beings are made out to be sort of like demons and they're like controlled through magic. But it turns out if you read the mountains of madness, they're just aliens, which is a really great reveal. And you get the whole story of where they came from. You get sort of the backstory, the, uh, of the of Cthulhu and all these creatures and at the mountains of madness, it's a great, a great little novella. 
I'm going to I'm going to go weird and say I think my favorite Lovecraft story that for me captures all the things I really love about Lovecraft is um uh the Dreams in the Witch House. Mm. Um Dreams in the Witch House is a cool story because it captures you get sorcery and magic but you also get like Lovecraft was an avid science person. He was himself Lovecraft didn't believe in any of this. He was a hardcore scientific materialist. And what's cool is that Lovecraft also was like an uh, amateur astronomer, he even like published the Rhode Island amateur astronomer magazine or whatever for a long time. And he really keeps up on what developments are going on in science. And if you know something about the twenties and thirties, that was the heyday of like relativity and quantum mechanics and Lovecraft is reading about that stuff. And he builds in um, relativity and quantum mechanics and stuff into the story. And he mixes it with all this witchcraft lore in a really, really cool way. And, um, and so I think I like that story the best. It captures to me what's all really fascinating about the Lovecraftian world where you get uh, science fiction and horror and uh, impending doom of all mankind, et cetera, et cetera. So I like the, I think the dreams in the witch house is my favorite story. I don't know that it's his best story, uh, but I think it's my, my favorite. Um, and it also has unfortunate like racism stuff in there, but again, you have to tell, deal with it. It's just there. Um, um, but yeah, I would say that I, I think aside from the other, maybe the next one after that would probably would be the, the Dunwich Har or the Dunwich Har, I guess, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And I would tell people, if you really want to start off reading Lovecraft, either read the Call of Cthulhu or the, the Dunwich Har, the Dunwich Har. And those would be the two places I would start. If you really want to dive into a Lovecraft story and you can find all these stories online for free. So even audiobooks of them, I think are all people have recorded really great audiobooks of them. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of different lore like that. Um, is there, you know, I was thinking is, it's kind of during that time period, there's, there's sort of, isn't, is there sort of a genre like that too? Like you mentioned, there's other writers. Yeah. That do. yeah weird literature. Yeah, it was a huge, it was, it was considered pulp fiction. That's where we get the name pulp fiction, right? It was books that were reprinted on the crappiest possible paper. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, cause they were cheap, like a nickel or something. They were, you know, and they would be, you get five or six stories and they would be, you know, and they were like, some of them were really crazily hilarious. Like, the brains from Pluto or something. It would be like classic weirdo science fiction. And, um, but yeah, Lovecraft published in uh, weird tales and other kinds of books like that. And this is also, again, where Conan and stuff was originally published and um, things like this. And so it was a kind of genre of literature and Lovecraft actually didn't do well in it. Uh, his stories are often rejected because they were too long or written in such a weird way. And he writes in a very strange idiosyncratic way. And so they were often rejected. Lovecraft didn't do very well, although he met and corresponded with all kinds of people. I mentioned Robert Bloch, the guy that eventually would write Psycho, um, but even ghost wrote stories for Harry Houdini. So you you can read story like, uh, I think there's one called Beneath the Pyramids that's published by, written by Harry Houdini, but actually written by, by H.P. Lovecraft. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, so it's it's... He again, he was that's another life story that's pretty amazing, Houdini. Yeah, Houdini is great. I love Houdini. Uh, he died here in Detroit. Oh, wow. uh, the 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 <clears throat> the funeral home that stored his body before it was shipped back is now an abandoned building. And I would I keep telling investors someone needs to buy that, turn it into a cocktail bar called the Houdini. You can make you could make bank. It's just That's it good, sells I mean, itself. If yeah. I had you know hundred thousand dollars or whatever, and, and if I were stupid because well, opening any bar or restaurant is stupid, but um, but I just feel like you could literally buy the form the former funeral home that had Houdini's body, the one place he could never escape. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. And so, um, I don't know. It's just an idea I've had, but yeah. So Lovecraft, yeah, wrote for Houdini and and stuff like that. Those are great. The I will, although I will say the one about the the under the pyramids is not that great of a story. Oh, okay, interesting. But, Kesha White, thank you for the super chat. Did a meteorite land in Arabia and get placed in the Kaaba? That's the going theory. Uh, that's that's that I've heard. The black stone is a meteorite. Um, uh, that's 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 what I've heard. I mean, that's what I've read. I don't know that there anyone has ever done any like hardcore geological testing of the the black stone and the Kaaba, uh, just for lots of reasons. I, I don't think that Saudi government's gonna let that happen anytime soon. But, um, but yeah, folks know this uh, on the side of the Kaaba, uh, the big uh, uh, or uh, square building that the Muslim folks uh, circumambulate during Hajj. There's a big black stone uh, encased in silver. It's rubbed, it's rubbed smooth now from lots of pilgrims touching it, but the good idea, the, the going idea is it's probably a, a meteoric stone that landed. And of course, I mean, if I were a person living in pre-modern times and I saw a rock fall out of the sky, I'd be like, 
that's magic which happens um, does happen it does happen of course you know what's even cooler is if you go to the egyptian museum in cairo you can see one of king tut's uh daggers and it's actually made out of meteoric iron which wow. uh it's, I mean, can you imagine? It's, it's one it's a cool thing just to have a dagger, but can you have imagine having a dagger literally from made space. from space from space steel? That's uh, like, I'm like, whatever kind of whatever kind of cool dagger you have, you don't have a cool dagger than space dagger, right? Uh, so yeah, so yeah, of course these these stones were unusual, and it's 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 probably I, that's what I've heard is it's probably a, a meteorite. That's the because I think that, there's some I think there might be a text. I don't know if it's in the Quran or not that says that it came from the heavens. So maybe there were. Maybe they're like alluding to it. it fell from the sky and they are thinking that's the heavens, obviously. So very well could. I mean, if you've seen that the image, the images just, just came in yesterday, right? From uh, whatever that meteorite that broke up over Northern Ireland, and Scotland, it's pretty impressive. If you were to see something like that land. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's interesting. People it's, who it's really, yeah, oh, it's really impressive. Um, and also I'll say, I think only one person's ever been killed by one. Oh. Um, I think it was a woman in Alabama, I believe. Wow. You can look this up, but all, I think we only have one recorded instance of a meteor actually striking someone and killing them. Um, yeah. um, which I'm surprised that anyone's ever been killed by one, considering that they're you know so rare, blah blah blah. But I think it's been the case that just one person has ever been killed by a, a meteorite strike. Uh, what a weird way to go. Yeah, I, I some of them some of them get caught on camera. I just found one from Russia. Maybe I can just play this real quick and if it gets. It gets oh, no, there, there. Happy birthday to you. Can I mute this? Or? Why is the cake? Okay, let me see. Sorry because about that. Because she's his wife. <laughs> All right, there we go. I muted it. All right. So this is from <laughs> stupid ads. I always have to get ads, but uh, who cares? Yeah, Another right. ad, of course. Yeah, course. you got you got to get uh, you got to get you get the ad blocker. Yeah. yeah, the ad blocker. Wow, this is a long ad too. What's going on with this? Hey, at least we get to look at uh, Alice Cooper. Right, right. Could be worse. Okay, um, now we got it. Yeah, this is the... minutes long. Okay, let me just skip ahead. See, look at that thing. Imagine seeing that in the sky. Look at that. Yeah, you can hear it too. I mean, it's like really shook window. It broke windows and stuff. If you were, a, I mean, if you were an ancient civilization seeing this, what would you think? You have no idea about space. You don't know what a meteor is. All you do is you look up and you see that thing in the sky. You would probably think that that was some sort of god or angel or demon or something, right? I mean, no, I, it, it seemed that would. I mean, I, I, it's a perfectly reasonable thing for me to believe that if yeah. something like that. If I were to say something like that, I'd be like, "Yep, yeah, that's the gods." Yeah, I, I don't sending us something. We got to go find that. Whatever that yeah. is, we'll see it. So, yeah, I, I suspect it. It may have been a meteorite. Also, meteorites are much easier to find in the desert. That's what I was. That someone else pointed that out to me. They were like, "If you if you're living in the desert, you could see the landscape of everything very far away." Yeah. So if anything is falling down from the sky, you're going to see it from a very far distance. It's Whereas if you black live, rock, yeah, if you live somewhere in like Europe where there's like you know trees everywhere and stuff, you're not going to be able to see that far. So yeah, yeah, I think that in the desert they could have seen it, and yeah, and also just wandering around the desert, you'd find it. It's a big weird rock in the middle of nowhere for no reason. Like, what is this doing here? This yeah. is this like weird looking thing. Oh, um, my one friend who's a Muslim actually, <laughs> he thinks that the Kaaba used to be white, and that people from touching it, they're brought their sins onto it and their sins got taken out of their bodies and brought onto the Kaaba. I was like, that's an interesting look. Well, I think the cover of it is black, but I'm not sure what, what color it is under uh, if the stone is 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 maybe it's basalt, but if yeah. you could you can see YouTube videos of, of what the inside of it looks like. It's not that impressive inside. It's you right. know, it's, it's bigger than you would think because you see it's from far away. It's like three stories tall. But um you can see videos of the inside of it and, and again it was a pre it was a pre Islamic shrine that got co opted by by Islam, they did it with the Temple Mount, right? Even the Bible says that it was a Jebusite temple area, and it was reseized by by it was seized by David, and it was reconverted for Yahweh. Now, uh, the early earlier y'all there was no centralized place for Yahweh worship prior to that, and uh, the Jebusites were there first, and it was a cultic site for the Jebusites. Um, and we find Yahweh shrines. There's one in Tel Dan. There's one in Tel Arad. Um, there was some kind of Yahweh shrite out at uh, Kuntalit Arjud. So there were all kinds of, and in fact, we have King Josiah even shutting down all of the, the other Yahweh sites. Not, he didn't, did, he didn't just destroy the, um, share poles and all that stuff. He also closed down all the other, uh, Yahweh worship sites that weren't the one in Jerusalem. And so the Tel Arad shrine was probably, um, destroyed, um, by, by Josiah and, you know, Yahwehist king. So. What is exactly are the Jebusites? 
it's one of these cannot Canaanite peoples that existed sure. there. You know, there's, I don't think we know much about them, but um, but yeah, the Bible certainly has a memory of them being there, and yeah, you know, they're you know they're the Moabites and Jebusites, and there's all kinds of peoples living down there. And in fact, the earliest example of the Hebrew national script that we have is a Moabite inscription. It's just that the Moabites have been occupied by the Israelites and learned to write uh, using their script. And when they when the king uh, when the Amorites were thrown out by Mesha. Mesha celebrates throwing the Amrides out, writes the Moabite uh, stele, but he writes it in, in a Hebrew script. So these people are all very closely connected together. In fact, the Moabite language is only slightly different than the Hebrew language. And I'm sure the Jebusites, whatever they were, uh, would have been to our eyes indistinguishable from all those other people. Yeah. It's interesting stuff, all this lore and everything in the history. Um, so back, I guess we can go back to the, uh, the Necromonicon. Um, I'm trying to think of another, another thing I want to ask you about this. Did, did this thing, was this thing like ex extremely popular right away or did it, did it sort of have a period where nobody knew about it? So that's a good question. I know that, I mean, the magic, the, the, the magical child publishing company and the warlock shop in Brooklyn in the seventies was sort of like the epicenter of occultism in a lot of ways on the East coast. Um, uh, and whatever, you know, New York sets the often sets intellectual trends so it was like one of the places if you wanted to study the occult or whatever where you wanted to go and i think the guy that owned it whose name is escaping me now was sort of an occult superstar and uh, when magical child published stuff and they were known for publishing really high quality stuff uh, folks may know them for for people in the occulty world you probably know them most famously for their public their printing of uh reprinting of true and faithful relation the text about john d and it's it's really beautifully printed they did a really really great job and so I think that I think that when the Necronomicon dropped, um, they rushed it to print. The guy that rushed it to print, maybe Peter Lavenda or whatever, they rushed it to print, knowing it would sell well, and and it did. I think I think that's six hundred sixty six copies sold out fast. I think they did another hardcover run of a thousand, and then it went to Avon Publishers, and I think it's been in, in it's been in reprint ever since. So um, yeah, I think they knew it would, it would do well, and it has done well. Wow. Um, I mean, this is just such a, it's, it's just in its own category, I feel like. So it's like, um, it's just one of those things that like, there's very few th pieces of literature or like the Bible, for example, or some, you know, the Quran is all these, obviously those are religious texts, but like, there's very few things that you can point to in history that just stand in its own category. This is one of those things I feel like. Yeah. It's, it's a, a again, it's one of these books that was so good that it had to be invented. And not just invented, but invented 12 times. I don't know how many times they people have made Necronomicons. Um, and there are sequels to this book, by the way. Like, this book has, like, three sequels. There's the Necronomicon Spells and Simon Speaks. I think there's even lectures, like, cassette-recorded lectures from the early 80s, mid-80s, wow. of the guy that, that compiled and wrote this, Simon, giving lectures about this. And they're all a mess. I've heard some of them before. And he just makes all kinds of crazy errors about all kinds of stuff. Um um, but yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it spawned its own cottage industry so much so that, uh, there were occultists like Ke uh, Kenneth Grant that really, Kenneth Grant was one of the disciples of Aleister Crowley and Kenneth Grant really did believe that Aleister, uh, Aleister Crowley, that, that, that Lovecraft in his dream life did tap into, uh, another, another reality and that these entities that he dreamed up were really real at some level. Kenneth Grant's a squirrely guy, and so it's always difficult to know exactly what he means. But there are people who do believe that Lovecraft made contact with other kinds of entities, and these entities described in Lovecraft's books are real at some level. Um, that he con that he made contact through them with his dream life, and despite the fact that he himself was a materialist scientist person, he still his unconscious mind was was in contact with these things, and that the Necronomicon is also. Um, sort of a another bridge to them and the magic in here is effective um you listen to chaos magicians other people that work with this stuff they say it, it's effective and there, there's a there's a love magic spell in here in fact i just mentioned this on my channel the other day um there's a love magic spell in here that has to do with taking the juice of an apple and uh saying some magic words over it and then giving it to whoever you want to fall in love with you and i'll fall in love with you i guess whatever that kind of love is um nice. but uh but he said he tried it when he was 16 and it worked. So. 
interesting i don't know i'm i'm you know me i'm i'm pretty skeptical of this kind of thing right but, right um, it's still it's, fun to talk about it's, still, it's, it's super fun and it has a great history you know and it's also just fun to look at it as a, like a like again like the boundary between what is a joke and what is fraud and what is a text that we make up and people come to believe in you know like where are the boundaries of those kinds of things like the book of mormon like where are the boundaries of a text that's clearly invented by somebody and also clearly meant to be taken seriously, but also clear fraud. Um, I mean, the Hebrew Bible we can clearly see in the Bible where they're they either they're they're, they're lying or making things up or bending history to their own narrative. And it's just interesting, sort of what becomes history and what becomes uh, what becomes you know what becomes truth. Right. And truth often transcends what really happens, right? Uh, people interested in the truth often don't let uh, pesky things like facts get in the way of the matter. Yeah, yeah. This is an interesting comment from Rat King. There is a theory that Lovecraft, Tolkien, and Robert Howard were friends or pen pals, and they had either been using magic, mushrooms, or DMT. No, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I know that Lovecraft and Howard were, were pen pals, or they, they, they had correspondence. Tolkien, I don't think so. Tolkien wouldn't have had anything to do with it. They are from the same time period, though. Yeah, those, yeah roughly. Yeah, I think Tolkien's a little later. Um, the generation, maybe a half a generation later, but uh, no, Lovecraft was a teetotaler. He wouldn't even drink alcohol. Oh wow! Like, oh, he was like hardcore about temperance. He wrote uh, articles about how great it, you know, how great temperance was, and alcohol was a devil, and you know, no matter what you think about alcohol. Uh, but um, his love, Lovecraft was all about prohibition. He thought it was the best idea ever. So he was a total. He was a teetotaler. So I don't think uh, you couldn't get Lovecraft to, to drink a beer, much less, you know, smoke DMT <laughs> or right. do magic mushrooms. So I think there's no I think there's not a snowflakes chance in hell you're going to get uh, Lovecraft to, to take shrooms. Uh, I think, like I said, I think he wouldn't drink a glass of wine. And DMT is sort of a especially I mean, I mean, not like other parts of the world where like South America, I know they do it for a long time, but I think it's kind of modern. As far yeah, as it's just, you have States. to synthesize it chemically. You, I mean, yeah. ayahuasca, you could you, even ayahuasca, it's pretty difficult to prepare. You have to have both the uh, uh, MAO inhibitor, yeah, inhibitor, inhibitor in her and the actual thing, and you have to cook them down or whatever. Yeah, no, Lovecraft didn't have any access to anything like that. And certainly, I mean, I'm sure he had access to magic mushrooms as much as anyone does near whatever cow pasture, but uh, no, I like I said, he wouldn't, he, he'd blush at the idea of having a glass of wine with dinner, much less like tripping yeah. balls and seeing cthulhu or whatever it's he definitely to, definitely an interesting comment though yeah it's yeah it's interesting again i always joke about this in my channel that there's always a dmt guy in the comments there's always yeah. someone there's <laughs> always someone in the comments who says no matter what it is gnosticism DMT. this that magic they're like it's dmt right it's like it's like the one-stop shop to explain anything watch, unusual. watch too much joe rogan yeah it's like it's the joe rogan hypothesis uh yeah <laughs> It's like uh, it's DMT, and I'm like, I don't think it's DMT, guys. Yeah, um, I think Lovecraft just had a weird imagination and had a weird dream life, and uh, was able to capture that and put it into spooky stories. I think it's as simple. Yeah, as he's that. one of those rare minds that just give us give us great stuff, even though he has a dark side that is just ir like it's just irredeemable. Yeah, 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 and it's you like, know. He still he still gave us this. So yeah, it's a great story. Yeah. And, and again, yeah. I've walked around, I've done the walking tour where he wrote a lot of his stories and based a lot of them. And you walk around and it's just like the most beautiful neighborhood you can imagine. And you're like, what the hell's spooky about this? I mean, yeah. maybe it was scarier back then somehow, but he lived in like the most affluent part of Providence. He lived right near Brown. And um man, um yeah, and he turned just everyday things. I mean, he was just he was a he was a person who was deeply afraid of reality. He he was a he was a sickly guy. And the outside world terrified him, uh, and he translated that terror of immigrants or terror of whatever into spooky stories. Wow, that's interesting. Well, I know you said you only had an hour. You have to go, you know, dear, dear, uh, you got stuff to do. So um, yeah. thank you for your time. And uh, Yeah, of course. We'll do this again soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Neil. Um, yeah, great to hang out and take some questions. And again, talk about the Necronomicon. It's always fun. And definitely go subscribe to Justice Sledge Esoterica. Links in the description, and you've just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis.